Family, one of the truths that we see all throughout the pages of Scripture is this truth. Scriptures reveal to us the reality of adversity. Somebody say yes. yes. I said the Scriptures reveal to us the reality of adversity. Jesus frames it this way in his conversation with his followers in John 16. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Is that what he said? I said, is that what he said? He said, as long as you have a residence in this world, you need to have an expectation to deal with a degree of adversity. Now, why would Jesus make such a prophetic proclamation? Why would he tell us that it is inevitable that we're going to experience some adversity? He's not saying that to create pity. He's saying that so we can engage in preparation. Are y'all following me? And honestly, this is one of the purposes of some prophetic words you receive. When God gives you some unique insight about what's coming into your future, very often the way some people respond to that is they respond to the prophetic with praise. When that's not incorrect, but if that's all you do, that's incomplete. Because the prophetic comes not just so we can engage in praise, but the prophetic comes so that we can engage in preparation. God doesn't tell us it's getting ready to rain so we can shout. He tells us it's getting ready to rain so we can build an ark. Come on here. God doesn't tell us I'm getting ready to blow you up from the flow up just so you can get excited. God's telling you he's going to blow you up from the flow up so that you can establish some infrastructure so that you can properly handle the blessing that's coming into your life. Because without the infrastructure, the addition of blessing will create agitation. And instead of the blessing feeling like a blessing, the blessing ends up feeling like a curse. And I don't know about you, but I want to be so blessed that I'm not stressed I need somebody to talk back to your preacher and say he talking to me yeah I need I need to be so blessed that I'm not stressed Jesus speaks about the inevitability of adversity he's saying listen I need you to know you don't have to listen to me that you don't have to experience exemption come on in other words you don't have to be exempt from it to get victory over it Y'all missed it. He says, victory doesn't come through the avoidance of adversity. Victory comes when you overcome adversity. And so the posture of our heart and the mentality of our mind must be, I'm going to win anyway. I need 1230 to talk back to me today. I need somebody with some fervor and faith and enthusiasm to say one word anyway. Lie on me anyway talk about me anyway close doors in my face anyway try to sabotage my success anyway try to block what God's doing anyway try to ruin my reputation anyway try to steal my client anyway try to steal my woman anyway try to steal my man anyway because I don't have to avoid to win I'm a win anyway and somebody, you need to say that so that the enemy can hear it because you're, maybe you're facing something right now or experiencing something right now that's causing you to call in the question whether or not you're going to step into everything God has for you. But God tapped this country preacher from Mississippi on the shoulder and brought him to 380 Premier Parkway, Duluth, Georgia today to tell you he can do it anyway. Jesus speaks to the inevitability of adversity in this world. That you don't get exempt from adversity until you make an exit from this world. So if you're going to be a winner, stop expecting to live without battles. Y'all better come get me here. As long as we have a residence in this world, 
there will be tribulation. But here's gospel. Here's the good news. The gospel isn't a gospel of avoidance. The gospel is a gospel of overcoming. Jesus didn't avoid Judas. Jesus didn't avoid the grave. But Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father anyway. So it means that the believer must be battle ready. Let me go over to this side and say it again. It means that the believer must be battle ready. Why do you think the Old Testament is filled with so much violence? Can y'all handle me shaking your theological tree a little bit? Y'all do know the Old Testament is filled with battles. You don't know, you do know David fought Goliath. Y'all not talking to me. He took a slingshot, threw a slingshot through the rock to an area of Goliath where he was exposed. Goliath was knocked down and David went and took Goliath's sword and finished Goliath off. Why? Because sometimes the giant is dazed, but it's not dead. And when you don't finish it, you walk, come on here. You think you killed a problem in one season and then you move to your future and that Goliath tap his show, tap you on the shoulder because you knocked it down but it wasn't dead. There are some things you got to kill it dead. Let me go to this side. I said there are some things you got to say, listen, I know I'm not going to live a life problem free, but this is my last season dealing with that Goliath. I'm not just going to knock it down. I'm going to finish it off. I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but if you're in 40 and over, you know these words, finish him. And I don't know who and I don't know what you're facing, but this is your season. Finish him. It's not a gospel of avoidance. It's a gospel of overcoming. In the Old Testament, you see Israel trying to occupy a promised land called Canaan, which represents a quality of life available through the belief, for the believer through our Joshua, who is Jesus. Come on now. Am I making sense? So that's what it's a metaphor for. It's a metaphor for the John 10, 10 life. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have a life and have it more abundantly. Not abundance in life, but abundance of life. The Zoe life. The God kind of life. Where you're rich in the right places. <laughs> Emotionally rich. And relationally rich. Where you got not just mental health, but mental wealth. I want some, am I talking to anybody that want to be mentally wealthy? I want to be wealthy with positivity and optimism and peace and joy. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want that. You will deal with adversity as long as you have residence in this world. You're going to deal with adversity. Because you're an imperfect person. So some of your struggles going to be self-inflicted. There are some, watch this, every decision is pregnant with the potential to produce a season. <laughs> and some seasons you we in is because of decisions we made. I made a decision. It produced a season. So as an imperfect person, I make imperfect decisions and some decisions produce seasons. So I have some adversity that's self-inflicted. But I can win. I messed up, but I'm still going to win. I made some mistakes, but I'm still going to win. I wasted some time, but I'm still going to win. I got in my own way and I'm getting ready to get out of my own way. I'm still going to win. imperfect person but I also live in an imperfect world 
So not only do I happen, life happens. So there are some struggles for which there is no explanation. There's an instance in the Bible where one of the disciples, one of the disciples asked Jesus a question. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither one. Life is lifing. So there's some struggle you're looking for an answer for that you'll never get. We know all things work together for good. Some people say everything happens for a reason, but the Bible never says God will tell you the reason everything happens. So I don't know about you. Maybe you got an explanation for everything you went through, but I still got some stuff on my list in my past. And I'm saying, God, I, I don't know how you use that. I'm not saying you didn't use it. I'm just saying you ain't told me yet. <laughs> imperfect person. So I make imperfect decisions. I live in an imperfect world. So some adversity is going to come because I just life be life. But then there's a third area. That's an avenue for adversity. And that is as an imperfect person living in an imperfect world. I got to be in relationship with imperfect people. <laughs> And sometimes I'm dealing with that adversity that is the consequence of somebody else's imperfection. But because I'm in close proximity to them, I experience collateral damage from the damage they did to their own life. And sometimes the context of those imperfect relationships is the context a family. Sometimes the fire you under is friendly fire. You see, there are a number of words that we could use to describe the construct and the concept of family. We could use words like divinely designed because family is not a good idea. It's God's idea. We could use words like socially significant because when families are strong, communities are strong. When communities are strong, cities are strong. When cities are strong, states are strong. When states are strong, regions are strong. When regions are strong, nations are strong. When nations are strong, the world is strong. And it's tied and interwoven into the fabric of the family. We could say that family is immensely invaluable. Sometimes you don't know that family is all you need until family is all you have those are all words that accurately describe this concept and this construct called family and we could do a whole sermon series just on that but that's not my assignment because there's another word that we could use to describe the reality of family and that word is complicated somebody say complicated yeah, when I say complicated, I'm referring to the complexities, complexities of managing diverse personalities, unspoken expectations, abuse, turmoil, entitlement, offense, competitiveness, combativeness, irresponsibility, unappreciativeness, unpleasable people, dealing with the tension of making a decision that pleases one and displeases another, that makes somebody happy and that makes somebody sad. I'm talking about the complexities of being misunderstood and known the least by people who's supposed to know you the best. Come here. I'm talking about being a man like David who's been anointed to be a king and it takes somebody outside your house to see the king in you, your own daddy. Y'all not talking to me. Your own daddy did not think enough of you to even call you to the place and the space where you could get selected as king. How? Jesse, do you not even know there's a king in your house? And how do you feel and what do you do when the people that are supposed to know you the best are the people that actually know you the least? How, what do you do when you're seen by Samuel and you're seen by 